Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this morning. This is the second part of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus's four-part webinar series examining important issues and policy developments related to the Great Lakes. I am Tim Anderson from the Midwestern Office of the Council of State Governments. My colleagues and I here at CSG Midwest provide staff support to the caucus and we are helping manage this webinar series for legislators, legis legislative staff, and other Great Lakes leaders. Uh, before we get started, let's just briefly review a, a couple, of, uh, couple of items, housekeeping notes. Um, first, a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be made available on the caucus's website soon. Um, second, we ask that you please mute your audio to help reduce background noise. And then third, just to emphasize that we hope to have some active participation today and discussion. So um, whenever you um, have a question or want to uh, participate, please just either put a question in the chat or raise your hand at any time. So again, we appreciate everyone joining us this morning. I want to extend a, a special thank you to our future presenter, Mark Smith. Uh, we will hear from Mark in a few minutes. First, though, we just wanted to take a little time to remember, remind everyone about the caucus, about the work that it is doing, and about the policy agenda that shapes much of the caucus's work. Um, the GLC is a binational, nonpartisan organization of state and provincial legislators from the Great Lakes region. Any legislator from the region be can become a member. Membership is free and open to all. Um, you can find a list of the current members on our website from all the states and provinces at our website, greatlakeslegislators.org. Also on the website is our online enrollment form. So if you are not yet a member, um, we hope you consider joining. If you are a member, please encourage your colleagues to join this network of legislators from the Great Lakes Basin. Generally speaking, as you all probably know, the GLLC's work is guided by over the overarching principles of protecting the Great Lakes, um, getting the state legislators, provincial legislators, um, a forum to um, assume their role is central to um, protecting the lakes, and then also providing a plentiful source of clean, affordable water to the people of this region through, in part, state and provincial policy. So with that in mind, we're offering this webinar and hoping to answer a few questions this morning. For example, what changes and advances have been made in Great Lakes policy over the past year? What policy opportunities lie ahead for the rest of this year and beyond? These are the questions that we're going to be exploring this morning with the help of our feature presenter, Mark Smith, Mark Smith of the National Wildlife Federation. We also hope to hear and learn from all of you who are participating in this session. What have been some important policy advances in your state or province? Are there new legislative proposals or investments being considered this year in your state or in your province? Please give thought to some of those questions and consider sharing your perspective as we proceed with this session. Uh, just to kind of frame what we're going to be doing today and some of the things that and kind of things that Mark is going to be talking about. Uh, just a reminder that we at the caucus has created a five point policy agenda. This was part of a strategic planning process that the caucus and its members, its legislators, went through a few years ago. And this was the policy agenda that was developed by the caucus to help shape the work that it does on behalf of Great Lakes protection and on behalf of the, of the Great Lakes region, its states, its provinces, the communities in the basin. One, prevent uh, the curb nurturing pollution and prevent harmful um, algal blooms. The second point of the policy agenda, build climate resiliency in coastal communities. Third point, accelerate the cleanup of toxic substances and areas of concern across the Great Lakes region. Point four, ensure access to clean water. And point five, prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species. Now Mark is gonna qu focus quite a bit on some of the work being done in these and other areas from a federal perspective, but we thought it would be important just to, to talk just for just a few minutes about some of the developments that we've seen in the states and provinces on some of these um, and, and part of the caucus's um, policy agenda. So before I turn things over to Mark, I'm just gonna highlight a few of those developments. 
Um, we'd also welcome hearing from all of you about what your view on some of the important developments that have occurred in your state or in your province. Um, so some important notable recent developments that we've been follow following uh, on the issue of clean water and drinking water. Uh, this past summer, Illinois legislators passed House Bill 3739. This is a law that requires all local water utilities in the state to develop and execute plans to completely replace their lead service lines. These utilities will have many years to make this 100% replacement that's required in the law, but they are required to remove a certain percentage of lead service lines every year um, based on the plans that they put in place and that are approved by the state. Uh, under this law, priority is going to be given to projects that replace lead service lines in areas that, for example, have daycare centers or other high risk uh, areas. And as a reminder, too, Michigan became the first Great Lakes state, I believe first in the nation, to require the removal of all lead service lines. That was done four years ago through the adoption of the administrative rule on lead and copper. Another part of uh, House Bill. 3739 in Illinois is that it requires that the state establishes a program to help low income households who are struggling to pay their water bills and may face the prospects of being disconnected from their water services. That law has helped facilitate the creation of a $42 million program for low income households that Illinois launched late last year. Another development related to the policy agenda in the states and provinces was what New York voters did last year. They, they amended their constitution declaring that each person shall have a right to clean air and water and a healthful environment. And that vote um, that on the ballots last year came after legislative appro approval of this clean water proposed, this right to clean water proposed constitutional amendment. Um, on the issue of invasive species, much of the region's attention right now has been on a U.S. Army Corps of Engineer project in Illinois to stop the movement of Asian carp and other invasives. Mark will be discussing the Brandon Road project, which has been able to move forward in part thanks to funding and other commitments made, this, made by the state of Illinois, which is the Army Corps' non-federal sponsor for this project, and by the state of Michigan. But I just wanted, we thought it was important to note that there are some other ongoing efforts in the region to address concerns about invasive species. And just to highlight one state is, is Minnesota. Um, through that state's Environmental Natural Resources Fund and its budget for the current biennium, the legislature is uh, investing millions of dollars on things like funding invasive species research at the University of Minnesota and funding inspectional, inspection, removal, and public awareness campaigns regarding invasive species. We've also seen quite a bit of movement in our Great Lakes states um, trying to address the problem of nutrient pollution in the Great Lakes Basin. Much of this work is being done through new voluntary initiatives and partnerships that try to encourage and fund evidence-based nutrient management practices on agricultural land. Last, in our first webinar, uh, first um, webinar of our four-part series, we heard a little bit about the H2O, H2 Ohio program. And that's a really significant program that started um, in its first year, provided $50 million um, to farmers to adopt evidence-based practices. In its first year, it enrolled more than um, more than a million acres. And under the H2 Ohio program, it started by targeting 14 counties in the Western Lake Erie Basin. It's since expanded to the remaining 10 counties in that basin. Also in Michigan, Michigan is investing in a new $25 million pilot project this year to reduce phosphorus runoff into, the, into Lake Erie. It's a pilot project in which the state is offering new incentives, and technical assistance to farmers as well as conducting soil testing and water monitoring to measure the results of that new $25 million investment in Michigan. And then in Ontario, the province has a Lake Erie Agricultural Demonstrating Sustainability Program that aims to support best management practices on farms within the Lake Erie watershed. So those are just a few examples of what we are seeing in our states and provinces, particularly over the last year in terms of some of the related to our Great Lakes policy agenda. We'd really appreciate hearing from you later on and what, what you'd like to kind of highlight going on in your states or provinces. But first, I'd like to turn things over now to our featured presenter, uh, Mark Smith, who is the policy director for the National Wildlife Federation's Great Lakes Regional Center, which is based in Ann Arbor. In this position, Mark has testified on a wide range of Great Lakes 
wildlife and conservation issues before the US House of Representatives, the Michigan and Ohio legislatures, and other state and federal agencies. His longtime leadership and advocacy on behalf of the Great Lakes has included significant work on the Great Lakes Water Compact, as well as on continuing efforts to advance policies that prevent, prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species. Mark, thanks again so much for putting the time into putting this presentation together and for joining us this morning. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Thanks again. Well, great. Thanks, Tim, and good morning, everyone. I am honored to be here with you all. Um, and you know, with that introduction, again, I'm Mark Smith. I'm the policy director with the National Wildlife Federation's Great Lakes office. My office is located out of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, but I've been working from home for the past two years, so it's really wherever my computer is. Um, I've been with the National Wildlife Federation uh, almost 22 years. Um, before NWF, I uh, worked in DC. I was uh, a, a staff aide uh, for two members of Congress in the 90s. So I like to say that I basically got a, a master's degree uh, working on the Hill. I learned so much. And so I uh, kind of got my love of, of policy and making a difference. Uh, and I, I applied that to conservation. And so I went to work for National Wildlife Federation uh, after about five years on the Hill. Um, I did a lot of natural resource policy work for uh, the former congressman from Minnesota. He was the chair of the House Natural Resources Committee. And then I also did some work for a delegate from Guam. And I was ahead of, I ran all his resources and uh, 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 House Armed Services work, mostly focusing on environmental cleanup uh, in Guam. So that was a very interesting perspective and I learned a lot doing that. But I took that from the Hill and I went to National Wildlife Federation in our DC office, worked there for about four or five years. Um, cut my teeth working on the energy bill in the early 2000s, um, and I picked up my bags and moved out to Ann Arbor in 2004, and I completely have adopted the Great Lakes. I, I'm originally from Virginia, but I really have grew up as a saltwater guy, but I really couldn't believe the, the magnificent resource we have here in the Great Lakes, so I have completely adopted them. And I like to always say, if you can find your home by looking from space, uh, you, you live in a special place. And that's really what uh, drives my passion. Um, we all have a common share of, of sharing a love for the Great Lakes. And that really drives my work. And I found a kind of a career that I can, you know, protect the environment, protect our resources and do it through policy. So um, that's kind of who I'm, who I am. And, you know, I've been at NWF uh, like I said, 22 years, mostly doing a lot of um, policy work, but it, I have worked with a lot of our state affiliates. And for those who don't know National Wildlife Federation, we've been around for quite a long time. Um, we were originally created in 1932, um, and we uh, have a unique federation model, whereas we're a national organization, but we have affiliations with um, state chapters uh, in, across the uh, United States. So in the Great Lakes, we have Michigan United Conservation Clubs and MUCC. We have Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, uh, Minnesota Conservation Federation, Prairie Rivers Network in Illinois, Indiana Wildlife Federation, uh, the Ohio Conservation Federation, um, uh, Penn Future in Pennsylvania, and Environmental Advocates in New York. And so we work with our partners quite a bit on state level policy, uh, ranging anywhere from invasives to water management to uh, wildlife funding to, um, you know, Great Lakes related work. And kind of the, the main thing our Great Lakes office does is really find the sweet spot between federal policy and its connection to the regional policy, and then obviously its connection to the state level. So that's kind of where we kind of like to put our, um, our focus on is those three tiers of policy. And so a lot of times, for example, most of my time is focused on congressional work, but um, where there are opportunities to engage at the regional level with the governors, we play a role in that. And then we also dive in at the state level, depending on the issue. Most of the time we partner with our state affiliates when it comes to state level legislative work. Um, so that's kind of who NWF is. We're known as a convener. We uh, collaborate really well in the region. We like to bring groups together um, share common priorities and work together to accomplish some of our goals. 
that's kind of what we're known for. So for example, we co-chair the Great Lakes Healing Our Waters Coalition, which is the major group. I'm sure you probably have heard of that coalition um, that advances uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative work. But we also uh, partner with businesses. We have the Great Lakes Business Network, which is a consortium of businesses, uh, mostly in Michigan, but we are expanding out into um, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Ohio. And these are all businesses that are, are see the value in protecting and restoring Great Lakes um, uh, resources because it's good for their business, but it's also good for our region. And then we also work with the hunting and angling community. So we, we co-chair a coalition called the Great Lakes Conservation Coalition, which is comprised of most of the major national, regional, and state-based uh, wildlife conservation organizations. So we really kind of hit all the, the different types of constituencies in the region from business to the hunting and angling, the more conservative side of the aisle, um, and to our traditional environmental uh, community. So we really try to play big and we like to play in different spheres. And so that's really where we find our, our work um, makes the, the, the best um, uh, path forward is by working together with different types of communities pushing for the same uh, policies. So, and, and just the last thing before I get into my, my, my talk here is that um, about three years ago, actually three years actually last week, um, uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer appointed me to the Great Lakes Commission. So I'm also a Great Lakes Commissioner on the Great Lakes Commission representing the state of Michigan. So um, every state has a different type of formula for appointing commissioners. I know Minnesota has a unique uh, policy of promoting most of their uh, legislator, legislators onto the, uh, the uh, commission. So I work with Senator Ann Risk quite a bit. Um, so I have a good perspective working with the region and also the states as a member of the commission. So. Um, Tim asked me to talk a little bit about some of the things that have happened here in the Great Lakes over the past year. So what I'm going to look to do is, and I'm very informal, I, I'll, I'll, on some things I'll be high level, some things I'll be more in the weeds, um, but I'm looking to have more of a conversation with you all. So um, I really have broken it down into kind of three areas, really. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we accomplished last year, and there was quite a lot. And then I'm also going to look at what's the landscape for this year? What are some of the things that uh, last year set up? for us to, to, to advance this year. And then obviously we'll, we'll, we'll finish up on a little bit of what do these uh, accomplishments at the federal level, what does that mean for us here in the region? And specifically, what does that mean for us here in the state level and how can we leverage all the great work that's happening at, at the congressional level? And obviously open it up for you all to have any questions or discussions. So Tim, you go to the next slide. All right. So, um, the biggest thing I, I really have to touch upon is the significance of the historic investment and in water infrastructure that Congress accomplished last year. You know, for many, many, well, some people decades, but years, we always heard of infrastructure week. Um, well, it is, it is really, it happened. It finally happened. And it was done by a bipartisan uh, process. And it was, all, you know, and so last fall, the, 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 the the, the actual accurate name for it is the, is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, ILJA, but everyone just calls it the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And this was the first significant, I mean, historic level of investment in upgrading our infrastructure. And infrastructure means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But for us here in the region, it really represents a reversal in a lot of ways of years of disinvestment. Um, and this is the single largest federal investment in water infrastructure in our nation's history. So, you know, let's, and, it, and, and not only is it an investment, but it also sets up for um, implementation and a framework for us to uh, really allow an equitable distribution uh, of applying uh, money to the states uh, via grants as opposed to prior work as loans and it sets an, an environmental justice principle. So this is really, not only is it significant historic investment, but it really helps um, modernize how we will implement this uh, funding levels going to the state so we're more equitable and deliberate and um, sincere in where this money will be going. So there's a list of things that, you know, that are in this bill that I'll go through really high level. And significantly, the biggest one is, uh, it is a, an additional uh, investment in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative of a billion dollars. And this is, will be on top of the annual appropriations 
um, that Congress already had increased at 25 million uh, per year, increased over five years. Uh, we're currently at 375 million, so we're going to hopefully get up to 400 million a year. This additional a billion dollars is a will be over five years, and it really will go to cleaning up most of the toxic hotspots. So, for example, I think GLRI, we've already we're pretty sure that this money will be um, allocated to really finishing the job of cleaning up these areas great areas of concern. And the list was uh, for decades long, just it was an extensive list of projects and it never had the funding uh, needed to get us over the finish line on this. So our hope is that this billion dollars is gonna be uh, enough money to get us over that hump and, and really wipe out all the AOCs in the region in the next five to 10 years. Um, so significant, but it also provided, you know, example, $50 billion over five years uh, for the, the state uh, uh, state drinking water revolving funds uh, through EPA that goes to clean up some uh, water infrastructure projects, 15 billion for uh, lead line replacement, 10 billion for uh, efforts to address emerging contaminants. Um, these are just a few of the, of the uh, amazing investments that we're going to see uh, with this. So it's just, it's really a huge accomplishment and it was done bipartisan. Uh, fashion, so it really is is a significant accomplishment, and that sets us up when I talk about uh, the landscape for this year of how do we play off that? How do the states and the regions leverage that? So the other thing that really happened that was big um, was our efforts to keep invasive carp out of the Great Lakes, and it just seems like this project at Brandon Road in Illinois has been talked about for quite a long time. Well, I think this past year. Uh, really uh, was a huge step forward to making this project become a reality. And the biggest um, uh, uh, advancement that happened was finally, Illinois as the state uh, uh, non-federal non sponsor uh, agreed with Michigan uh, on how to fund the state of Illinois' portion of that non-federal non uh, cost share. So with Michigan's help, uh, the, the, the cost share of the pre-construction engineering and design phase of this project was covered. So Michigan chipped in about $8 million. Illinois picked up the, the remaining two, and that covered the cost. And then obviously um, that allowed for the US, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the state of Illinois to sign an, a design agreement, which was major, which allows the pre-construction engineering design phase or essentially getting your architectural designs for the project in motion. So that was done. two huge things that were big accomplishments. Um, but through this infrastructure bill, um, the Biden administration announced that they are actually going to cover the remainder of the pre-construction engineering and design. So that will be completely taken care of. Um, and then they're also going to cover the first full year of construction of the project. Now that's huge because as you know, what's going to happen is the project is going to have to be Scaled, scoped out and have a final project design, but then Congress has to actually come back and appropriate the final cost. Because right now we have the project authorized by Congress, uh, but it's not appropriated. So what's gonna happen is there is a cost share part of this project that has 80% federal, 20% non-federal, in this case, Illinois. So by covering the first full year of the project will help this project become seamless between the end of the for pre-construction engineering design phase to the first year. It'll avoid some delays. Now we still need to fund the entire project. Um, and that's one of the things we're gonna talk about um, as we go to the Water Resources Development Act. <clears throat> but those are the two big things that I think that we can really look back on that really will help shape us moving forward in the 2022. So Tim, you wanna go to the next slide? Now, don't get, don't get crazy when you see this. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but it just shows the, the level of opportunities we have. Um, so before I get into the details on this, what has happened? What's the, what's the atmospherics that are happening in DC right now? Um, I mean, certainly we have the, the, the troubles in Ukraine right now um, and Congress's attention towards dealing with that, the administration's attention to dealing with that. That provides a, a great deal of time uh, capacity for the administration and Congress to deal with that, that could be very uncertain what happens to the congressional schedule because of that. You add in the fact that um, we are operating under a current continuing resolution on fiscal year 21 
levels of, of spending. That um, will expire, I think, March 11th. And so that will be the third extension. Um, and so Congress has to figure that out. Are we going to have another continuing resolution to give us more time to figure out some details on how we get a budget? Or are we going to have a massive omnibus bill um, come together to fund the government? And it seems like um, that will happen. I think some of the chairmen and women in the Senate and the House have come up with a framework to have an omnibus appropriations bill that will fund the government so we will not have a shutdown. Um, the details are still unclear. And that's really, really, as you all know more than anyone, how that we can get into trouble if we don't know the details. So that provides a little cloud of uncertainty, but it also gives a sense of the focus. Congress will have Ukraine, the budget, and then you throw in a Supreme Court nomination that we'll have to uh, deal with in time allowed on the Senate floor for that. Um, so there's a lot of things happening um, that are gonna be causing some time, time shifts. Oh, geez, I should mention, it's an election year. So it's March now, uh, Congress likes to get out and, and, and go back home and, and campaign. So we have a shortened time frame, uh, congressional calendar to work with uh, for all these things that we're gonna talk about here to get done on top of the, the three dynamics that I mentioned earlier. So, so let's talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that's gonna happen. We certainly know that with all the money that GLRI got uh, last year through the $1 billion increase, you're probably thinking, why do we need more? Well, this program is successful. It, is, it, it breeds success. And it is the core to our region when we have an economy that is based on our water resources. Um, not only the outdoor economy from the hunting and fishing side of things, but tourism, our businesses. We have the most dynamic region in terms of our ag um, products here in the region. So GLRI helps our region be competitive and a force to reckon with. So increasing money that uh, uh, to the GLRI returns the, our dollars spent that we have on this program. So um, we, we're gonna be seeking increased dollars and there's an appetite to do this in Congress. You go up to the Hill, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Yes, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, we, we're, we're gonna support it. So we think that we have a good opportunity to increase these to 400 million a year this year. But we also need to figure out how do we get these dollars implemented in a way that is equitable and is really driven by some uh, from the ground up, you know, getting some community involvement um, of where these projects should go so we're having an equitable distribution of these dollars spent to some potential um, underserved communities, maybe even some disadvantaged communities can get some resources here. So that's going to be one of our key opportunities moving forward. Um, as I just finished talking about the Brandon Road, invasive species. The biggest thing that we need to work on this year are two things. Number one is uh, given the policy, the, the, I'm sorry, the funding challenges that we're gonna see with the Brandon Road project, we need to make this project a full federal project. And what I mean by that is right now, like I mentioned, the 80% federal and 20% non-federal, that's the current cost share ratio right now that was authorized under the last order. Well, we need to uh, re re rectify that and make that a full federal project. So we're going to look to the Water Resources Development Act, which is the massive bill that has all the Corps of Engineers projects that used to be every four or five years when I worked on the Hill, but now it's about every two years, two to three years. It's a massive bill that will, will, that will uh, allow projects to, to move forward. Um, and it's an authorizing bill, um, so you can't appropriate it on it. Um, but uh, this is the chance for us to make this a full federal project. And there's precedent for that. The, in fact, the current um, electrical barriers that are in the Chicago area waterway system um, are that was originally designed to actually keep round Gobi coming from the Great Lakes through the Chicago waterway system and down into Mississippi River. Um, now they are, are only deterrent in a lot of ways from keeping carp and other invasives from coming up the Mississippi River and dumping into the Great Lakes. That's a full federal project, that, which meant that Illinois is the lawn federal sponsor, but they didn't put up any dollars towards that. They were a partner in this, but the federal government from design to construction to operations and maintenance in, perpetu in perpetuity is a federal government role. And because that project will not just benefit Illinois, it benefits the Great Lakes and it, and it benefits our friends uh, in Canada. It's a multi-state, multi-jurisdictional project. It's the definition of why the federal government should come in and cover this. And there's other priorities like the Sault Ste. Marie locks up in Upper Peninsula, Michigan. 
Um, it's not just, just because they're based in Michigan, those locks don't just benefit the state of Michigan, it benefits the Great Lakes and it benefits our Canadian friends. So the full federal government comes in and covers that entire cost. No different here for the Brandon Road project. Uh, there's no reason to make this, uh, the state of Illinois bear the burden of a huge 20% of the cost. Because right now, if the project was approved today and done, its projected cost is $826 million. Now that may not seem like a lot when we're talking in the billions that are coming from this infrastructure bill, but 20% of that for the state of Illinois is huge. It would almost make, it almost kill the project. The state of Illinois could not be able, was, would not be able to fund this, nor should they. It's not their burden. Um, so we're gonna really look to change this cost share and um, to, to, to not only get this to be full federal, but to advance this project, that would stall out this project. And we can't wait anymore because CARP are at the footsteps or the doorsteps, if you will, about 55 miles southwest um, of the Great Lakes in Lake Michigan. So this needs to move forward. That's our number one priority is to get that done. The other thing happening right now is uh, there's a, a ballast water. Um, ballast water ships from across the world come into the Great Lakes for commerce, but they also bring in invasive species. The most notorious is the zebra mussel. And so many, many years have gone into trying to figure out the best way to regulate um, ballast water invaders. And um, the, the previous administration did not finalize its ballast water standard. Congress passed a bill called VITA, the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act, which set up a new regime to, ba to manage ballast water. Unfortunately, um, the previous administration's standard was not strong enough. Um, so now EPA under Biden is looking to reassess and to finalize this. And things have changed since uh, the last rule was put out by, uh, the draft rule was put out by Trump. The biggest one is that um, our Canadian friends have finalized their ballast water standard, which regulates all vessels, saltwater vessels and lakers, only the lake vessels that move amongst the Great Lakes. And so we need to make sure that our US ballast water standard is at a minimum consistent with our Canadian standards so that all vessels are regulated under the great, under the um, uh, um, EPA, um, because even though Lakers who operate only in the Great Lakes, they didn't bring in invasive species, but boy, they sure move them around. And so it doesn't make any sense to not regulate them. So that's one of the things that I keep an eye on. That's mostly an administrative level side of things, but um, there is an opportunity under a new congressional veto law for states to play a role um, if the standard is not strong enough. Let's move on to infrastructure. As I mentioned, we have a lot to do, even though we had a lot of accomplishments last year. <clears> the <throat> main thing is implementing the ILJA or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Jobs Act. And mostly it's in, is a equitable implementation. And this is gonna be key because a lot of the districts that you all represent, um, you know them more than anyone. Um, how can they play a role in getting some of these infrastructure dollars to help their communities? So there's, we're working with the EPA and the administration on distributing these dollars equitably. That's a role for the state legislator to come in, work with your governor to help these dollars flow to, to, into the places where they need to be. Um, let's go to clean water and wildlife. This is where probably the biggest uh, section of things that are going on right now. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Farm Bill. Um, Farm Bill is the, probably the single largest uh, conservation bill ever written by Congress. Every five years, it expires in 2023. And this provides basically, uh, you know, not only does it provide for agriculture, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, agriculture uh, improvements and incentives for our farmers, but also it provides a lot of uh, health benefits for schools and, and, um, and some uh, nutrition benefits. This is an opportunity where our state level work on algal blooms, water quality really can be leveraged here. Um, I'm going to combine the Build Back Better bill, which was the climate bill, that included, which passed the House, that included $27 billion in it for agriculture programs. Now, why is that important? Because when we look to authorize, reauthorize the farm bill, this farm bill has an opportunity with a lot of potential money to play with, which means more dollars going into restoration programs. For example, here in the Great Lakes, focusing on Lake Erie, where we know algal blooms are a big problem, but other, other lakes and, and waterways have algal bloom problems as well. They're really targeting these dollars for um, cover crops for farmers and providing some climate resiliency programs that will be allowing some of our farmers to get more dollars to figure out ways to keep soil where it is, 
and keep our water clean because we, you know, 117 million people in the country drink are, are, are needing clean water. In the region, 42 million people rely upon drinking water. So the Farm Bill is a huge opportunity for us to bring in dollars to help some of the state level work on algal blooms. Waters of the USA. So this has been an ongoing back and forth seesaw I, that I've ever seen. And the, the cut it to the chase, this is the rule that basically determines what streams, what wetlands are covered for protection under the Clean Water Act. It's been a back and forth for many, many years. And the biggest uncertainty now, the previous administration uh, had a, uh, a standard that would have weakened protections for clean for our streams and wetlands. But then the Supreme Court now has taken up this case. And so adds further uncertainty on what's going to happen. I have no idea. My crystal ball is really confusing right now. I can't tell you what's going to happen. But it's really going to be interesting to watch what happens because we have the current EPA figuring out what to do with a new standard while the Supreme Court will uh, make a, a ruling on the previous rule, uh, standard. Super confusing. And I don't I don't even begin to think what's going to happen on this, but it's going to be a wait and see. We won't probably know maybe till the summer or the fall what's going to happen with that. Two last things in the water and wildlife areas, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. That has basically um, been very popular in Congress. It's passed the House in the previous, uh, previous Congress. It's, it's moving through the House uh, committees. Uh, it's been introduced in the Senate. A lot of our Great Lakes uh, delegation has has joined in on this, uh, Congresswoman Dingell here in the Great Lakes, but Senator Stabenow, Senator Portman, um, bipartisan members of the Great Lakes delegation are supporting this bill. This basically helps our state agencies keep species off the threatened and endangered species list, which then when they're put on this threatened and endangered species list, it's, it's, it's a huge time suck. It's a huge investment of money to make the habitat necessary for these critters and wildlife. So we need to keep them off the threatened and endangered species list. So this is where this funding comes into the state to help the state management state agencies figure this out. Every state has a, a wildlife action plan. And right now they pro pretty much receive about $1 million annually to help do some of this work, nowhere near enough. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act will, if passed, will provide $1.39 billion, which breaks down to about I know Michigan, for example, will, re will receive about $26 million annually if passed. Other states, there's a, there's a formula, so other states will have uh, varying levels of, of, of funding levels, but it just gives you a sense from going from approximately $1 million now to help the states implement their wildlife action plan to all of a sudden the DNRs or the, or the parks and recs departments in your state having $26 million and above. A lot of money that does good work that will, in the end of the day, save wildlife, but also keep them off Endangered Species Act and, and costing more dollars down the line. Um, PFAS, a lot of people know what PFAS is. You know, it's basically everywhere. It's in our drinking water. It's in our um, uh, firefighting materials and it causes severe problems. It, and right now in Michigan in particular is ground zero where not only is it in our drinking water, but it's on some of the military bases that have used uh, PFAS laden chemicals, spills into our drinking water. Um, and it gets into our wildlife. A lot of times you're in streams, you see foam on the water. That's the PFAS and it's highly, um, highly toxic. And we haven't done enough yet to, to figure out how to keep our communities safe, people drinking water safe and our wildlife safe from PFAS. There is a bill um, that is, uh, is moving and we need it to, to pass is that the PFAS Action Act, which basically makes PFAS a toxic, under, a toxic that should be regulated under the Clean Water Act but it also uh, provides the federal government to issue a standard for the discharge of PFAS materials. And it also gets it um, listed as a hazardous material under CERCLA. So we gotta get that moving forward so that we can protect some of our communities and wildlife from this. this. And it's everywhere, it's not just in Michigan, it's everywhere. Um, Ohio Mississippi River, I brought, I put this on here because it's an example I wanna bring up. I know we're talking about Great Lakes, but you know, our Great Lakes are basically surrounded by water. Well, we're also to the south and west and east of us, we have the, the Mississippi River coming down that borders a lot of our Great Lakes states, but we also have the Ohio River coming in from the southern side of our state. Why I bring this up is there's two efforts underway right now to basically create a GLRI-like program for the Mississippi and the Ohio River. Now, the Mississippi River and the Ohio River are very different than the Great Lakes. They're working rivers, um, but yet they provide drinking water, recreation, 
and commerce uh, activity uh, for you know 25 million people plus. And so we're looking to potentially craft a framework uh, for the Ohio River to be presented to Congress to help create a framework that will provide like a GLRI -like program. We're not anywhere near yet on providing a bill uh, like GLRI in Congress, but Mississippi River, they're already there. A bill has already been introduced to basically create a GLRI for the Mississippi River, uh, invasive species for uh, water quality, nutrient reduction, and climate. It's called MIRI, Mississippi Investment Restoration and Recovery <laughs> Investment <laughs> Act. I think I got that acronym wrong, but I can look it up and give it the exact one, but it's MIRI. And it, I, I bring this up because it just shows you that people are trying to duplicate the success that we had with the GLRI and the work that we are doing in, in the Great Lakes. So we should be proud that the GLRI is working and so other communities and other ecosystems are trying to copy and duplicate that. And lastly, there's a lot of opportunity for climate resiliency. As I mentioned, the infrastructure bill that passed um, will provide some lead line replacements and some climate provisions, making some of our infrastructure more climate resilient. But there's also this big thing called the uh, Build Back Better bill, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. And I'm not getting into the politics of it, but what I will say is that it passed the House and it provides tremendous, tremendous, unprecedented resources, $550 billion that will go for climate provision, you know, that will build off the infrastructure bill. A lot of, a lot of infrastructure make com communities more resilient, um, so removing some lead from drinking water, uh, some water assistance programs, uh, wastewater treatment facilities, all, all making our wastewater and our infrastructure more resilient to climate change. It's, it's it's significant investment that passed the House and it's kind of in misery right now in the Senate. If it doesn't pass as a, as a one package thing, there's already been some communications back and forth, I'm sure you've seen in the news, about potentially peeling off some of these things and passing them individually. Um, we're not there yet, but I think that could be a potential path forward. Um, there's still a lot of conversations happening about that, but this is a bill that could potentially uh, transform our infrastructure and set us on a path that would really be um, um, in a better place to really mitigate the changes that we're seeing in the climate, uh, to changes that we're seeing from climate in the region and, and position us in a better, better path forward. The other thing we need to fund is the Great Lakes Coastal Resiliency Study of US Army Corps of Engineers. It was authorized under the last WERDA and we need to get that funded because that's gonna provide a roadmap for the states to really figure out how best to protect our shoreline Right now, we have a lot of hardened shorelines. Uh, anyone who lives in the Great Lakes knows that the, uh, just about a, a year ago, we were at all-time high on water levels. We're, we're, on the, we're kind of going down lower now. These lake levels are cyclical. They're going up and down. We're at an all-time high last year. We're on the trend to potentially go down, but we're still at a, at a high level. Uh, the 80s were the all-time high until we surpassed it last year. So it's about every five or so years they go up and down. Just a handful of years ago, for example, we were dredging in Michigan for some of our harbors. Now we're at an all-time high. So this resiliency study is going to look at how we address, how do communities, municipal communities, and some of our private landowners assess how we can make our shorelines better to, uh, uh, to adapt to whether it's high water or low water. So that's, that's going to be one of our, our biggest challenges getting that funded uh, this year. That's a lot. That's a lot. But I'm going to move on, Tim, go to the next slide. So what does this all mean for us here in the region? And, you know, as I mentioned, I, and even Tim indicated in some of his slides earlier about some of the things that have passed uh, in some states, the real big question is how do the states take advantage of some of these federal dollars? And I didn't even talk about some of the COVID relief dollars that are, are sitting in some of the general funds in the states right now. You know, Michigan, for example, is using some of those COVID relief dollars to replace all the lead lines in Benton and, and Benton, the community of Benton Harbor. So there's there's tremendous amount of resources, and how does the state set itself up to receive those, distribute them equally, and really take advantage of uh, these dollars that are coming in to really resolve some of these long time projects that we we have? So implementation, whether it's from the COVID relief bill, from the from the infrastructure bill. Um, and from the potential provisions that would be, could be passed by the Build Back Better, state needs to assess how do we receive these, working with the governor to come up with some priorities. And that's ongoing now, but we really need community involvement. And in Michigan, for example, we've, we've brought in some 
frontline communities in Detroit to figure out some projects that are a priority and working with the governor to distribute some funds equally. And also the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. You know, a lot of our state DNRs are facing a challenge of, of sustainable funding into the, into the future. You know, hunting and fishing license sales is just not enough to keep up with the, the, the maintenance and the work for wildlife management that they need to do because without wildlife management, without your DNR, you're not investing in a huge outdoor economy um, that hunters and anglers and trappers use uh, to really pump in massive amounts of dollars into the state coffers. Um, you know, people want to hunt, people want to fish, people want to recreate. That's that's a in, that's a investment that returns. So, the Recovery America's Wildlife Act will be a good uh, uh, investment. Our bill, like I said, mentioned the Build Back for Better, Build Back Better provisions. And then the, the main thing I want to talk about, I, I had H2 Ohio and the water bond. I bring this up as an example. H2 Ohio was kind of the signature policy uh, for water infrastructure, wetlands, and agriculture programs in the state of Ohio. I bring it up because I do think it is an example to other states to potentially replicate. Um, it will start going into effect this year. So we assume that this will be an effective uh, program. Um, it's too early to tell since the programs are just kind of getting started off this year. And that was based upon some budget surpluses. Um, is the state going to be having enough capacity to fund this program into the future? Unsure. But that is an example of a program where I think that could be very successful because it builds out specifically on ag and nutrient reduction programs, build a ladder of conservation for farmers to help see a path forward by putting in some best management practices on their land and it sees the path forward to get to a better place. And so if that doesn't work out for some reason, there's some early conversations on a water bond, putting it on the ballot. But again, with all these federal dollars, how does a bond uh, come into play here from the farm bill dollars, from the Build Back Better and the, and the infrastructure jobs and build, infrastructure jobs bill? How do the state assess that uh, a, a way forward to leverage those dollars. And the last thing I think I want to bring up is here in Michigan, we have the recreation passport. So whenever every year when I register my car renewal, I have the ability to check a box to say, yes, I would like a state passport to get into all the state public, public parks. It was originally created for $12. I can check it and I get a state park and put on my license plate and I have entry into unlimited entry into state parks versus showing up at the park kiosk and paying the person at the door or whatever. That has generated a lot more revenue because especially during COVID, people have really gone to the outdoors and they really have been valuing going to uh, public spaces and nature has been helping heal during COVID. So states are, are strapped. And so this was an opportunity to get more revenue for the state. But right now, there's some talk about having an opt out version of this. And I don't, I don't know how many states have this type of program. But when I would have, if this passes now, this bill that was being talked about, if I go to register my car, I have to uncheck the box uh, to get uh, that I don't want the state passport. Just that simple mechanic of unchecking, it's an extra step for me to do, it will probably generate more money. And there's been some, there's some data that, that the state of Montana has used that when they had a opt out feature, the state generated more revenue. Uh, uh, for the state management agencies to, to manage the resources of the state. So those are just some of the opportunities. But the big question for you all to discuss is, is how do we take advantage of all these resources and how do we do it efficiently? How do we distribute them to the right people in the right community? So I'll stop there. That's a lot. And I'm happy to open it up for any discussion or questions that you all may have. Mark, thank you very much. Um, yeah, definitely. We have a few questions in the chat, but um, I would welcome anyone to unmute themselves now and um, ask a question to Mark. Or if there's anything that's going on in your state or provinces that, uh, right now or or recently that you think is um, worth mentioning in terms of some of the things we've been talking about, in terms of Great Lakes policy, in terms of the caucus's agenda, certainly um, feel free to to ask a question to Mark or or to just kind of. Um, add some comments um, from what's going on in your own state. We'd welcome that right now. Um, Mark, uh, this is Mike Sheehy from uh, Northwestern Ohio. Can you hear me? I yes. can. Okay, and thanks very much for the presentation. It's stimulating, uh, so much there. Um, 
I live in a, I represent a district uh, in the state legislature, right where the Maumee uh, uh, empties in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. So not surprisingly, the big issue with me and uh, my colleagues, we have uh, two big water treatment plants. Uh, we have Maumee Bay State Park and uh, every spring, you know, we could uh, pretty, pretty well assure that there's gonna be the massive uh, amounts of nutrient level coming down the western base of Lake Erie, which uh, sometimes even uh, uh, becomes uh, toxic. And uh, we have even shut down water treatment plants in, in the past. So, uh, and, and to your point, uh, the, there's, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, cover crops and things like that uh, suggest a minimum, minimum amount of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, improvement. And uh, the governor has the H2O program to his benefit. Uh, he's expanded some uh, wetlands, uh, at which I think uh, along, the way, uh, along the Lake Erie shore that seems to have, uh, I, I think, uh, do a lot more of, of, of soaking up nutrients. But um, I wonder, uh, uh, there seems to be a strong correlation between uh, the uh, amount of manure uh, it, from a uh, large animal feeding operations uh, that are established in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. And uh, I, I wonder if, um, if, 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 has there any been any discussion the, of that at the federal level to uh, deal with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly we have had human waste. We deal with that in an effective manner now. How about in ma massive amounts of uh, animal waste? Yeah, no, thanks, Michael. Thanks for the question. And, and uh, I've driven through your district quite a bit. <laughs> so uh, you have a very nice district. Uh, you know, I, the, the thing is, I think there has been conversations, I know, in the past on the Farm Bill about providing incentives for farmers uh, to not apply certain amounts of, of, of manure Certainly during uh, the frozen months, and so it just gets on the frozen prop, it gets on the frozen top of the ice, and then it just runs right off. Um, there have been conversations, but it's mostly been at the state level um, that has, has and then the deal with. So I think I think at, given the fact that Michigan was looking to uh, do the same as I think Ohio bans a frozen application of a manure. I'm I think it does. Um, I think there has there's an opportunity to to talk about this at the federal level and working with NRCS to maybe provide further incentives for farmers not to do this, at a minimum, more education on this. Um, but to my, to my knowledge, there really hasn't been um, much um, effort at the federal level to do this, and it's been kind of looked to the states to do this, and maybe they're in there, they're in, that's the challenge uh, of resolving this, is that there's kind of this give or take, let's let the states take care of it at the state problem uh, versus a federal problem. And so there's that dynamic between who's Who's really who has the jurisdiction, if you will? Well, just and just a final question. You know, what, what, we're tr trying to we're moving for a, a, a forty percent reduction in those uh, uh, in those nutrient loads uh, in the Western Basin. How close are we to achieving that? Are we seeing any significant reduction uh, uh, in the, the possibility of making reaching the, the, that goal of? a 40% reduction, and then I'll shut up. And thank you again. <laughs> um, great question. You know, this is not my specialty, but what I understand is that it's been very hard to actually track that. How do states actually know that they're reducing by 40%? So for example, in Michigan, which has the small sliver of the Lake Erie uh, shoreline, you know, a lot of their 40% reduction has been saying, well, it's just let's just ratchet down on the Detroit wastewater facility. And you know, that might be it. We might, just, we might achieve that 40% without doing any further um, controls on uh, private land. Let's just ratchet out the, the wastewater treatment. Well, that's just not, that's just, it's hard to really track that. Um, but I, I'm certainly uh, hopeful that there's this thing called blue accounting that helps some of the states figure out all the dials and the dashboard of all the rules and regulations and stipulations that are happening in the state and how that all plays into actually achieving some of these goals that are set. So I do, I do have some hope that the, some of this data collection and plug it into this, this dashboard will help provide more accountability. So we actually know these, the provisions and laws that we're passing are actually making a difference. So I, I do think that that needs 
much more data collection um, to make it help more, help us be more accountable. Great, Th thank you. And yeah, and the, just to follow up on the Blue Accounting, the, the Great Lakes Commission is, has led that work. We have um, had some previous webinars on the work of the Blue Accounting. I think that's a really promising way to, to measure how state programs, state investments, how well they're doing on the ground. So the Blue Accounting through the Great Lakes Commission is a great, and, and Nicole, thank Nicole, would you like to speak about that? Would you be willing to speak about that? Just for a little, Nicole just sent a, uh, a link to the, the Blue Accounting website, but I don't know, since we have Nicole on, I hate to not take the opportunity to have her just talk briefly about it. Hi, everyone. Um, no, I, I was delighted to listen to Mark's talk and forgive me, it's a work from home day, so I'm not going to go on camera for <laughs> you all. Um, but we did finally launch Blue Accounting in our new website format um, on February 1st, which was interesting for me. It marked my six years at the Great Lakes Commission. I had spent that entire time um, trying to make Blue Accounting actually happen. And we think in this new version of the website that we're getting closer. Um, but I would really love to get some feedback from um, your legislative community on how the navigation is on the site, if it's answering your questions, if there's things um, that you'd like to see improved. Um, to Rep Sheehy's question, we, we did work with the Annex 4 subcommittee um, to figure out a path. It's very simple, um, but we are using the gauges um, for Lake Erie and also for Lake Erie states and their watersheds um, to really say, was the target met and how frequently has the target been met over a 10 year time frame? And so it doesn't get into all of the um, very fancy statistics that I think a lot of the water quality experts and scientists um, like to think about, but we haven't been able to get there to, to Mark's point that tracking has been challenging. And so um, I think this first kick is on the right track, but we built this thing for you guys and your colleagues in Congress and Parliament and for our mayors around the Great Lakes and would love to hear back on how we're doing. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to, to look at the website and to give that feedback. The, it is in the chat. Um, we have a mix of uh, questions in the chat and hands raised. Um, Carlos, um, you had paid your hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself? And um, there you are, Carlos. You have a question? Okay. Thank you. All right, good. Well, uh, not so much a, well, a question, but also a bit of a comment. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I'm Carlos Leitao. I'm a member of the Quebec uh, Legislative Assembly, um, and I represent uh, a riding in the Montreal area, um, a riding that uh, you no know, borders on uh, Lac Saint Louis. So we are right in the right in the, in the Saint Lawrence Seaway here. Um, and of course, one of the issues we've had, uh, the most important issue over the past couple of years, three, four years, uh, is flooding. Uh, so 2017, 2019, we have you know, massive flooding. Um, and the legislation here has, uh, you know, has, has tried to, to, to adapt and, and, and catch up with, the, with that reality. Um, and just, just this past week, uh, we, uh, a, new, a new bill came into effect. Um, that uh, you know, it's, it's a rather radical bill in the sense that it says that if you live in a flood zone, well, you're going to get flooded. <laughs> this might seem like you know, a very radical thing, but, but uh, it does give municipalities uh, you know, extended powers to, to better regulate uh, you know, the, the way, the way we, uh, we occupy the territory, especially in a large metropolitan area like Montreal. Uh, I think we we, we built uh, a lot of uh, a lot of residences in areas that where shouldn't have been none. But anyways, uh, so that's one of the big issues uh, that that we are facing here um, in in Quebec uh, along the Saint Lawrence Seaway. There's another bill uh, that is making the rounds um, of the legislative process. It's a it's more of a, of a environmental uh, omnibus bill uh, that looks at different different aspects. Um, uh, and there's a great deal of discussion about water, about water use, uh, about access uh, to clean water. Um, uh, and I don't know, and this is the question I'm, I had for you. This bill is still still going on. We're not yet we're not yet uh, finalized. But again, here as there in the U.S., we're also in an election year, so I'm not quite sure how this is going to turn out at the end. Um, uh, by the way, I'm on the opposition side, so but <laughs> but the the the, the discussion is is uh, you know is is, is 
is widespread about about uh, access to water and about water quality. Um, and uh, a lot of the discussion now centers around the price, centers around, uh, I mean, is water a free good, which it isn't, uh, and if not, then who should pay for it? Um, here in Quebec, uh, royalties on the use of water are, are, are ridiculously low. We kind of give it away uh, almost for free for large industrial users. Um, residential users are not charged on a, on a per use basis. So there's a great deal of discussion uh, trying to find a consensus on how to address this issue. Um, and I was wondering if, if that's something that in the, you know, in the Great Lakes area is also happening, uh, you know, the, the use of water. Of course, we know that we need to modernize our infrastructure as, as in the United States. We have a lot of older uh, things, uh, you know, water treatment plants, et cetera. So we need to modernize that, but we also need to make sure that water is used uh, more, uh, more efficiently. Uh, and for that, uh, an appropriate price would probably be a good thing. We are discussing it here. Um, how, uh, is the same discussion happening in the United States? Uh, thank you, Carlos. That I, I, you know, <clears throat> the price of water. I, you know, that that's been a long question here in the states as we look to implement uh, the Great Lakes Compact, for example, uh, regulating diversions of water. What water can leave the Great Lakes? Uh, how do you manage water in the region? How do you manage water withdrawals? What do you do with bottled water? Um, you know, all these things. And we really don't think that there should be a price on water. It's not a product. It is a resource, a public trust resource. So we really don't want to have any conversation around putting a dollar amount um, uh, around uh, water. There has been a couple of uh, um, things here in Michigan. For example, we tried to help uh, figure out ways to increase the permit fees for withdrawing water. Right now, for example, Nestle water uh, is almost getting away for nothing. Uh, you know, you know, millions of gallons of water, and they're not. And the state of Michigan is not collecting any resource royalty for that. And so, there's been some conversations about how we can collect a royalty on the permit, but not on the price of water. That's probably the better way to go about doing it, because we just don't want to get into any conversation about making water in a commodity that's trade like a good. That's that's not what it is. It's, it's a public trust that belongs to all of us. So I don't know. That's uh, that's helpful. No. Uh Oh, thank you. That, that, yeah, that, that is helpful. And, and perhaps I didn't explain it well. That's also the conversation we are, we are having here. Yeah. The fact that our royalties are, are, are in fact, North America's lowest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we should, we should be able to, uh, to take a look at that. Um, perhaps one last thing, more, more of a comment. Uh, of course, the uh, you know, um, um, agricultural runoff uh, is, uh, is, is a big problem. Um, uh, the previous speaker mentioned the manure here. Our biggest problem is, is pesticides, uh, pesticide use. Uh, it has been very difficult to come to some sort of a, of a consensus on, on how to fix this. There is currently a, a task force of the uh, provincial environment department, the agricultural department and the largest uh, agricultural um, association to try and, and get to a, a resolution of, of, of this issue. Um, uh, because it, it finds its way into the rivers and lakes, the pesticides, and then into the St. Lawrence, and then, you know, and on and on from there. So the, it is a very important issue. Um, uh, the uh, agricultural associations are, are, let's say we have work to do to be able to, <laughs> to, be able to get to some sort of a consensus um, on, on, on uh, pesticide use. Uh, and on the, the, the whole aspect of, of uh, sustainable agriculture. So that's a big thing that is also going on here. There have been some smaller you know, steps on the legislative front, uh, but we, we are still discussing it. We haven't been able to, to make any, any sort of big, uh, uh, big inroads uh, on that. And one last, last comment, <clears throat> an interesting one perhaps for you to know is that we, we rebuilt, uh, <clears throat> it was a massive project here in, in Montreal, to rebuild the uh, the Saint, the, uh, the uh, excuse me the Champlain Bridge, which is a bridge over the Saint Lawrence Seaway, uh, this was a massive project, uh, over five billion dollars, etc. Okay, fine, it was done, it is done, it is working. But now the interesting part was okay. So what do we do with the old bridge? Because there was a bridge there uh, for over sixty years, and this bridge was falling apart. That's why we built a new one. So now what do we do with the old one? 
um, uh, and there was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of uh, a lot of things to uh, 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 a lot of ideas on what to do. And then finally, the decision was to deconstruct the bridge. Now, to to avoid you know stuff falling into the into the seaway, and you know, and deconstructing a bridge, uh, as perhaps the engineers around the room will know, it's not a simple task. This is going to cost about a one billion dollars to deconstruct this bridge in 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 a safe way, uh, and without uh, you know without having any negative uh, environmental consequences. So it's a major project. is already underway. They've already, they've already done a few portions of it. Uh, it's a major effort. It's a major effort, and you know. I thought it would be interesting to share that with you that we are we're not demolishing a bridge we are deconstructing it very carefully okay <laughs> well, that's very interesting carl thank you so much and i'd be curious to thank you get access to some of that legislation you referenced in Quebec too. um yes have yes uh, the, so, so we have this new bill that is making the rounds mm -hmm. uh but the one that came into effect uh, just this this past week uh yes we we, we could send you the okay. more information on that if you will yeah Great. We have one Thank more. You. We have one more hand raise, and then we have two questions in the chat. I want to make sure we get to before we we, we end the session. Representative Troy has been waiting patiently. Representative Troy, do you want to get on and um, ask your question or comment? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, uh, Mike Fee and I we're probably the two oldest members of the Ohio House of Representatives, so we're probably old enough to remember uh, when Lake Erie was approaching Dead Sea status uh, back in the late fifties, early sixties, and you know, the, the movement in Ohio lately on the uh, agricultural runoff, you know, the problem is there's always been fertilizer, but we're now getting these, we're getting these gully washer storms. We get storms four or five inches at a time, which really wash that out. But everything is kind of a voluntary thing. And when we cleaned up Lake Erie the first time, it wasn't voluntary. It was the Clean Air, Clean Water Act that basically said you will implement primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment uh, along the lake shore. And and the good thing about that was the federal government paid for a lot of that. Uh, that now they don't do that anymore, and that's why I wince whenever they start talking about it, removing the tax exemption on municipal bonds. And say you're making us do stuff. Don't make it cost more. Uh, anything. Uh, Anything going on in the other states in terms of moving from voluntary, you know, voluntary is like, okay, you know, I won't eat meat on Fridays or, uh, you know, I won't do this or something. I mean, it, 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 it's, it sounds nice, but do we, are, are there other states that are basically, no, you're going to have to do this. This is required here. And then in these infrastructure bills, you know, this one or the one pending Build Back Better, uh, is the federal government going to get back into maybe helping out uh, regional sewer districts or major municipalities in, in funding improvements that they need, uh, uh, especially holding tanks now with these huge storms that come. So much of this stuff is getting pushed out of the lake untreated. So I guess that's kind of a multi-pronged question, but uh, any insight on that, Mark? And thank you for your presentation. Well, you bet, and thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's always an age-old question. Uh, you know, do you force the farmers to do something or do you allow them to voluntarily do it? And, you know, I don't know if it's either or. I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think, you know, there are a lot of farmers doing the right thing. Um, but, you know, sometimes, uh, and that's what the farm bill can come into play is, is providing those incentives to make it an economic uh, answer for them to do things. Um, and, you know, not slap them on the wrist, but steer them in the right direction. Um, and, you know, so there's, that's, that's always a question. One of the biggest challenges, actually, to be honest with you, is the power of the Farm Bureau. And any type of, I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm going to go, cut, I'm going to go straight to the chase and not to, not to bash the Farm Bureau, but they're very effective. And they have a very powerful voice in every state capital. And once you start moving away from a voluntary incentive to a more regulatory it's, it's, it's dead on arrival. And I'm going to be honest, that's, that's the biggest hurdle. And I mean, you could talk about potential uh, uh, ways to maneuver around that. But at the end of the day, without the Farm Bureau, uh, you're not going to be able to move things. And it doesn't matter if it's an all Democratic state or all Republican state. It's just a very tough thing. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think that there are some things that you can do. I think, you know, some of these, some of these educations on you know, like H2 Ohio, for example, this lab, so showing farmers where this, where they get some basic BMPs to get them going in the right direction. 
uh, you know, some of the conversations around you can't get federal subsidies unless you have a conservation compliance component to your farm, uh, you know, a, a conservation work plan that shows that you will do X, Y, and Z. So those are the conversations that the Farm Bill are really good at. Um, but boy, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a tough uphill battle. Um, and I do think that the Build Back Better gets to some of those uh, dollar questions you're talking about for some of the sewer districts. I do think that that's, it's, we, we have, we've turned a blind eye to uh, over many, many years of, of helping these local communities figure these questions out and, or communities that have resources and have um, uh, more, uh, you know, I guess a, a, a more, a more uh, oh, what's the right word I'm looking for? So, some of the disadvantaged communities don't have sophistication or savvy to get some of the federal funds or that they're, they're, they're loans and that's just unable for the municipality to pay them back. So I do think that the Build Back Better provision, you know, removing the loan versus a grant uh, will help. But, um, you know, I think that that's kind of the focus of what some of the infrastructure bill was doing and certainly what the Build Back Better provisions were, are trying to do. And just, just to add on real quick, because you had asked about any state requirements or mandates. The one thing that came to mind was a, a buffer law that was passed in Minnesota, I think in 2015, uh, it re required that perennial vegetation, vegetative buffers be placed around any lakes, rivers, or streams in Minnesota, and then even along ditches to have buffers around there. So that was, that's just one example, if you're looking for something that's kind of a more, uh, not voluntary, it would, it would maybe to look into the Minnesota buffer law if you're interested in something like that. Um, rep, we, just real quick, we had two questions in the chat. I wanna make sure we get to them. Uh, Representative Boy from Indiana asked, any discussion on coal ash contamination? Um, there are unlined ponds in Michigan and Indiana near Lake Michigan and a, a few that don't specify liner status in Illinois. So the question of coal ash contamination. Mark, any? Ooh. You know, I, I just don't know. That's a, that's a good, I know that if anyone's on from Illinois, that there's a couple of bills that might have gone to help with that removal efforts. I, I just don't know enough to be Okay. Uh, able to answer that. I'm sorry. I can look that's it up okay. and come we, back to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. We'll, we'll look into that question. We'll, we'll get back to Representative Boyd with some answers. But you did talk about, Mark, and this is from Susie Evans, about um, ballast water regulations, which has been an ongoing topic for so many years in the Great Lakes. And she and, and, and then the question of kind of the still outstanding at the, at the federal level, the, the new regulations. And so the question was, um, let me just make sure I get, uh, how likely are the, the, the ballast water regulations going to be finalized? I mean, mm -hmm. here, maybe in the next few months, a year, where, where do things stand on that? Well, <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> I hope sooner than rather than later. I mean, the thing is, is that um, EPA all last summer, was had it they since the rule was never finalized under Trump, technically it kind of was just never published. So EPA has two choices. They can either just totally scrap that and start over again, or they can work from it and keep the public comment period open and, and adjust it. And I think that's what they were trying to do last year. They had conversations with industry, they had conversations with the conservation community, they had conversations with amongst the governors and the state agencies about this uh, effort, you know soliciting more input and it went quiet. And I think from the fall till now, it's been very quiet. Um, we're not sure um, what's happening with that. And the hope is that they will take that new input, particularly from Canada, which is now that they're regulating Lakers because the Trump standard did not regulate Lakers and did not use the best available technology uh, that EPA could set a standard on. So. Our hope is that they will fix those two things and publish a new standard that will regulate all vessels and provide, uh, you know, using the best available technology. And that's what Congress passed a law to do. That, you know, they passed a law that you regulate all vessels and you'll provide, uh, you have to use best available technology. So our hope is that that's what's going to happen. My guess is as good as yours on when that's actually going to happen. I hope sooner rather than later, because even if the standard is finalized, uh, the, and, the, and the standard is done, the Coast Guard has to then finalize its draft rule and finalize its standard before this ballast water can go into, ballast water standard can go into effect. Because EPA sets the standard, Coast Guard figures out, figures out how to implement the technology and enforcement. So we're still, say EPA finalizes it, done tomorrow, we still have the Coast Guard rulemaking process to go through. And then once that's done, 
uh, it'll it, we're into uh, you know a new a new regime, if you will. And you know, I'm not sure. In the past several ballast water permits have been challenged legally, delaying implementation. So it's I I don't know. I hope it's soon because I would like to get this resolved and move on and and get technology on ships, see if it works, just like the normal permitting process is supposed to do. Five-year permit, put technology on. At the end of that five years, hey, did it work? Did it not work? How, what could we tweak? Is there new technology that's been advanced in those five years? If so, let's, let's assess it, let's certify it, put it on a ship. We just need to get into that regime otherwise because we haven't been doing that at all. I mean, so we're kind of in this uh, gerbil in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cage going around and around and we, we haven't actually put something on and tried it. And I think that's where we have to be right now is just let's, let's finalize it, get technology on and see if it works. And if not, We'll add it and change it again. So, Mark, um, I do want to just thank you again. You did such a tremendous job with your presentation and answering the questions. We really appreciate the time that you put into doing this. Um, and I also appreciate all the folks that really provided some really good questions and, um, and, and some good perspective from the states and the provinces. So I really do appreciate it. Um, we'll wrap up here. Uh, just a reminder, though, that this is part of a, a series of um, sessions we're holding um, through the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus. And so I hope you'll join us for our next two. Um, next Friday, we're gonna, and we talked a little bit about this today, but we're gonna really dive in depth of some of the opportunities that um, our region now has with regard to addressing some of the climate resiliency questions that were raised earlier in Mark's presentation. So that's gonna be um, next, next Friday, March 11th, 11 a.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Central. And then we'll uh, conclude our se series on March 18th with a, a look at the issue of plastics in the Great Lakes, an update on some of the science, um, and then discussions on future cleanup efforts on, on the U.S. and Canadian sides of the border. Um, again, thank you all for participating and joining us. Um, hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, thanks again, bye-bye.